evening, I'm Tanya Joaquin. Thanks for joining KHON2 for Hostage at Home, a 30-minute town hall dedicated to the issue of domestic violence. The month of October is Domestic Violence Awareness Month, but you may not be aware just how widespread abuse is throughout Hawaii and the troubling role that COVID-19 has played with stay-at-home orders, creating a worst-case scenario for victims of violence. In this half hour, we'll explore the toll that the lockdown is having on local families, myths about intimate partner violence, along with lessons learned, and how we can all be a part of the solution. Joining us for this important community conversation, we'd like to welcome our panel. Say aloha to four women who can add their insights about domestic violence. They represent the areas of nonprofit, legal, medical, and advocacy. First, State Representative for District 32, Wanalua, Salt Lake, and Aliamanu since 2010, Linda Ichiyama. Representative Ichiyama was instrumental in expanding the definition of domestic abuse and protections to include emotional abuse. Next, a leading voice on violence in Hawaii for three decades, Chief Executive Officer and co-founder of the Domestic Violence Action Center, Nancy Creedman. Dr. Alexa Sueda is here to offer her medical expertise on the harm of abuse that she sees as an OBGYN at Kaiser Permanente Hawaii. She's the physician champion for the Intimate Partner Violence Prevention Group at Kaiser Permanente Hawaii and has developed screening recommendations to support victims. We also welcome a survivor we'll call Mia, who wants to add her perspective about her three-year abusive relationship with her ex-husband and how she got out safely. Thank you to our panel for joining us tonight. Let's jump right into what domestic violence or DV is and isn't. This is a good springboard to start with Nancy. Nancy, what are some common myths and misconceptions? Uh, domestic violence is a, a pretty large uh, challenge for our community and communities across the globe. Uh, one of the biggest myths is that this is a problem that only happens to certain kinds of families and certain kinds of communities, when in fact, domestic violence does not discriminate. And we see uh, people suffering the harm of abuse who are uh, educated, employed, um, practicing religion, holding faith. Um, it's very easy to assume that uh, it's a problem that has to do with uh, drinking too much or poverty. Sometimes poverty and uh, substances will exacerbate or make worse instances of um, domestic violence, but it is not a contributing cause of domestic violence. So we're still sorting out for the community's benefit, uh, what is the problem of domestic violence so that we can develop uh, an effective and appropriate response as a community. Now you've of course been at the forefront with the Domestic Violence Action Center for 30 years, but there's still work to do as you say. What are some of the obstacles that are preventing wide public engagement? Well, I think one of the challenges that uh, we're troubled by is uh, victim blaming, that somehow the community believes that the person who is the victim has done something to deserve it or has provoked it or hasn't taken the right action in response to it. Um, like, well, if, I, if it were me, I would leave. Um, not really understanding the complexity of the problem of domestic violence and the enormous range of challenges and obstacles in the pathway for a survivor. So victim blaming is a problem that we're always trying to address. And um, it's linked to um, the general uh, lack of understanding that people have about the problem of domestic violence. Um, people think it looks like one thing. It's a broken nose or a broken bone or a laceration that you can see, but that's really not the case. Um, domestic violence is a pattern um, that looks different in different families and different couples, uh, different partnerships. Um, it can be uh, sexual uh, force. It can be emotional abuse or psychological. It can be demeaning. It can be financial abuse. It can be isolation. These are things, some of these things are not easy to see. Um, so people don't understand what is domestic violence and they often think survivors or advocates like myself are exaggerating the problem, making it up or making it seem worse than it really is. When in fact, we see it as being um, a, a pretty uh, life altering and life threatening. 
And there is a need to redefine exactly what DV is. Representative Ichiyama, back in July, the legislature passed a package of bills to protect domestic violence victims and support safer working environments. They cover reforms in the court system, as well as that expanded legal definition of domestic violence. What were the biggest revelations for you? For me, as the co-convener of the Women's Legislative Caucus, the two biggest things that I've learned in working in this area that were surprising. One was the prevalence of domestic violence in our community. Um, the University of Hawaii has done several surveys statewide of all 10 campuses. And both of those surveys over several years showed 20% of students statewide had experienced domestic violence, dating violence at some time. And if you think of the university system as a microcosm of our community, that's a very high number. Um, the second thing for me was the long-term impacts of trauma. We're learning a lot now as, as policymakers about adverse childhood experiences. So for kids who are growing up in homes with domestic violence or who may be victims of domestic violence, the impacts of that trauma continues for them for the rest of their life, affecting their health, affecting their social emotional well-being, and not in the way that we might think of, like maybe in terms of substance abuse or mental health, but also in terms of overall physical health, that trauma stays with them in the long run. And Nancy, I want to get back to you and ask you about the type of engagement that you would like to see on this because it doesn't just affect the victim. It doesn't just affect these families behind closed doors. It is a community problem. One of the things that we learned at the Domestic Violence Action Center uh, very early on was that this problem was way bigger than we are. And we really need the active engagement and the investment and the commitment of the community as a whole. And so we really need um, partners and uh, throughout the community businesses and healthcare and legal and courts and corrections, uh, clergy, uh, academicians to um, learn what domestic violence is, how they can become part of the landscape to uh, work beside us in assisting survivors get free, get safe, and make the very difficult decisions that they must. And I know some of those partners are not able to engage right now as we stay at home. And we're going to talk about that in a little bit. But I do want to shift gears to the public health and safety standpoint on this. And Dr. Sueda, I'd like to ask you what kinds of injuries you see when treating patients who have been involved with domestic violence. And what about their behavior and mental state? So when people are thinking about domestic violence, they often think of the physical injuries, um, which do exist. We'll see bruises and cuts, um, scrapes, or even more severe injuries. Um, oftentimes these will occur in places that can be hidden. So often abusers will target um, areas of the body that are covered by clothing or maybe not as visible um, to try to hide the abuse from others who may, um, may see the person who's being abused. Um, but we also see other injuries. Um, sometimes people will come in with vague complaints like headaches or abdominal pain, um, you know, some symptoms that are related to the ongoing stress and trauma that they're experiencing in their home. Um, and, um, and so it's important when someone comes in with sort of these vague and difficult to pin down concerns to ask about safety and health in the home because um, as Nancy had mentioned, um, domestic violence is not just the physical injury, it's also can be ongoing emotional abuse, ongoing sexual abuse. Um, and so we need to be on alert for symptoms of those as well. Um, sometimes people will come with concerns about their reproductive health as well. They'll come with multiple requests for um, infection testing or pregnancy tests. Perhaps their abuser is not allowing them to use birth control. Um, so although the physical signs are important, um, there are also many other signs that maybe others would not connect necessarily with domestic abuse, but um, are a um, big warning signs. Oh, that's why some call domestic violence the silent epidemic or the other epidemic. Is it a stretch to call domestic violence a public health problem? Domestic violence is absolutely a public health problem. Um, we know from research that someone who's experienced abuse, whether it's physical, sexual, or emotional, um, they do have a higher risk of ongoing health problems. Um, not just things like headaches and injuries that I mentioned already, but there's actually a connection to chronic disease, um, such as lung disease and heart disease, diabetes, obesity. Um, they all can be connected to trauma in the past. And so 
we need to think beyond just the immediate physical injury and think of the effects that domestic violence has on a person's health for their entire life. Um, in addition to that, as has been mentioned, um, there's an increasing body of knowledge that witnessing violence as a child does affect a person's long-term health. Um, and so from a community standpoint, it's important to address domestic violence as something that does not just affect the person who is who is experiencing the violence, although that is a huge significant effect. It affects their family, it affects their friends, um, and we know that it can affect the health of everyone around them. And we want to help break this cycle. Every survivor's story is different. We appreciate right. Mia coming on to share her story tonight. Mia, every domestic violence survivor has a turning point or a final straw. Can you describe the moment you realized that you had to get out of your relationship? The final straw was for me it was like the last action that he did because he had like my 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 abuse was on many levels as we talked about it was physical it was financial and it was emotional so when i my um, health assurance was cut i actually tried to ask why and tried to get in contact with him but he was not necessarily wanted to do it like right now it's on his time whenever he wants so he never answered and got back to me so that was my final the final thing that he did for me to be like no i'm done and i need him away from me because now he's uh, endangering me because if i don't have no health sessions what's going on you know uh, i can you know just yeah <laughs> anything can happen from that point so that was my final the final thing that he did that made me make that decision. Did you suffer the emotional and psychological scars and damage from the, some of the things that he would say to you throughout your marriage? Oh, totally. Like I'm experiencing as of right now, I'm in therapy, so thank God I'm taking care of it. But um, I have uh, now a panic attacks uh, regularly, anxiety, um, Every day I wake up with a lot of anxiety on how the day will go and how my life just can change from anything because that's what it was with him. It's like I will have a great day, but from a day to from a moment to another, it will be a, a nightmare. So this anxiety stays with you even if he's gone now. And I do feel safe because he's out of, of the island. But I do wake up with this anxiety that my my day could turn over and and just turn as a nightmare. So yes, there is a lot of psychology that I'm coming through. <laughs> We thank you for sharing your story with us here. We do want to touch on the COVID effect because we are living through unusual times. And Nancy, I know when the governor's stay at home orders came out, you predicted that there would be dire domestic violence consequences. How does stay at home play into domestic violence? Well, it's impossible to uh, live with an abuser and not be at incredible risk when uh, you have uh, no options, uh, no opportunity to go to work, no respite from your abuser controlling you, no way to uh, obtain information, no way to um, exercise a safety plan if you have one, uh, no way to make a telephone call to get any information. One of the things we did at the Domestic Violence Action Center right away was add a text and a chat feature to our communication systems so that survivors could reach out and uh, ask for information, ask for help uh, without having to make a telephone call with their abusers standing right beside them, able to overhear them. Uh, we have, um, since March, the end of March, when we began uh, collecting data, our staff have had um, 20,000 contacts with the clients uh, on our agency's uh, caseload. We have provided um, financial uh, legal information to uh, more, just about 6,000 uh, survivors and financial assistance to more than 350. Uh, our staff is very, very busy. People are prisoners uh, at home. And we know that this is spilling into the medical facilities too. Dr. Sueda, talk about changes in caseload that you may have noticed when COVID-19 appeared on the scene. 
So um, we're seeing mostly patients for urgent visits rather than routine visits. And so, um, you know, I am concerned that we have less opportunity now to talk to people on a more regular basis about their health. Um, in the past, someone would come see me for sort of a routine screening or a routine visit, um, and I could explore their relationship with them and see if they felt safe at home um, or have maybe an opportunity to um, assist them. But, um, but now I think oftentimes we know that abusers are using the COVID-19 as an excuse to keep people in their home. Oh, you can't go to your visit because of COVID-19. Um, you know, and, and they're even more isolated. So I do worry about the people who um, are at home and unable to come in to see us in person. The other thing challenge we've had is, um, you know, we do a lot more telephone visits and video visits, and that is very tricky because we don't necessarily know who else is listening in on the phone call or who else is in the room for a video visit. And so we've had to rethink how we um, explore people's relationship health. We can't really ask direct questions if there may be an abusers in the room that could put my patient at risk. So we're rethinking ways that we can try to get information out to our patients um, through emails or chats um, without necessarily asking questions that could put them in danger. On the legal side, the Women's Legislative Caucus bills and dealing with domestic violence law reform went to the governor's desk in August, while a lot of other bills were put on hold due to the health emergency. Did COVID-19 accelerate passage of DV legislation? Representative Ishiyama? The Women's Caucus has been focused on the issue of domestic violence really since its uh, inception in the 1980s. I would say this year was different for us because of the COVID crisis, because we had to recess session and then return in May and then again in June. Because we had such a short time to review the bills that normally we would have had a full four months to deliberate on, we really had to prioritize. So the Women's Caucus focused on domestic violence because of the issues that we saw arising that were created by the lockdown and the stay-at-home orders. And I think that really helped us elevate them. And uh, we were fortunate to be successful this year with three of them. Well, I know Nancy and all the DVAC clients appreciate this. I do have a three-pronged question for you, Nancy. How widespread is domestic violence? Which populations and communities are affected most? And what are their needs that you see? Domestic violence is very widespread. Uh, as I mentioned, with just a sampling of data that we've collected since the beginning of the coronavirus, we have a steady demand for assistance. We will never beat the demand. Uh, as I said at the uh, beginning of our time together, uh, domestic violence does not discriminate. It is still a very well-kept secret. It happens behind closed doors. People are embarrassed to be victims of domestic violence because of the victim blaming. Um, I don't think we have a really good handle on how large a problem it is in our community. Uh, we don't have a good system for collecting data across systems, for example. We don't know how many people are showing up uh, at their doctor's office or in the emergency room or um, at court matching up clinical medical visits with law enforcement visits. Uh, we need to do a much better job as a community assessing the enormity of the problem again so we can create a better uh, response. Um, an approach at the Domestic Violence Action Center where we have bilingual, bicultural staff who are working in each community. We have a, a COFA advocate who works with the um, uh, communities, uh, Marshallese, um, Chokis, uh, LGBTQ community advocate, uh, Korean advocate, um, Native Hawaiian program. Domestic violence crosses all cultural communities, and it's something that uh, we must understand from a cultural perspective because we don't respond uh, uh, the same to every cultural community. Uh, people are different, um, their cultural values are different, their cultural practices are different, and as a community, we must be responsive uh, to what their values are and what their belief systems are. Now, domestic violence has, of course, shined a light on the need for better responsiveness from institutions, not just government, but also business, churches, schools, and even families. What's worked and what does it teach us? And I ask this question to Representative Ichiyama. I think we're always learning. And like Nancy said, we're always trying to gather more data 
about prevalence and patterns. Uh, one of the things that has, has consistently come up is the need for early intervention, right? To get involved when the level of violence um, is low, when we are more likely to be successful with things like batters intervention training. And so that was the impetus for one of the bills that we passed this year, Act 19, which would allow prosecutors the discretion to charge a petty misdemeanor for a low level of violence. And if it's a first time offense, to allow to defer to acceptance of guilty plea and mandate that that perpetrator attend domestic violence intervention uh, programs. So we're really trying to make sure that we get involved early before the danger and the violence escalates. Dr. Sueda, what's working in the medical setting and what can we take away from those successes? So um, we, we approach domestic violence as um, something that can occur in any family. Um, and so we try to approach every patient um, and ask them about their relationship health um, in our OBGYN department, um, because we just, you, you just never know what family may be affected by violence. Um, and really it's important to open the door um, to anyone to feel like our setting is a place that can be safe for them. Um, it's very important that we talk to people alone. Um, it's very important that we ask questions in a sensitive way. Um, and we want to have um, materials and um, posters and pamphlets that communicate that our office is a safe place that people can talk about their relationship. Um, in addition, it's important for us to be aware of community organizations such as uh, DVAC, um, and other settings that can help our, our patients so that we can appropriately um, suggest places that can help and refer patients. Um, one of the most important things that we do is actually giving people a message that it's not their fault. Um, a lot of people um, unfortunately feel a lot of nervousness and shame and caution about talking about the violence they're experiencing, um, but we really try to emphasize that it's not their fault. Um, we just wanna be there to help it's not our place to let them know that they need to leave that day or that they need to do this or that. Um, you know, when someone is experiencing violence, they're the one that knows how best they can be safe. And our role is really just to provide resources and support and messaging that they don't have to um, put up with a situation that makes them either physically or emotionally in danger. I want to ask Mia, being a survivor and your story, people watching might think that they don't have anything to offer, but everyone can help. What are a couple of things that they might be able to do today? Well, the thing is like whenever you uh, meet someone that's going through uh, domestic violence in general, like you're going to see it in the way that he or she will act. So your friend will tell you he cannot go out because uh, he has to come back uh, fast because of his partner or when the when you see or feel that he's shaming himself a lot or his or herself a lot or just putting herself into a position of like kind of like down compared to his partner that could be signs and maybe encourage him to contact DVAC or talk to someone because it's really about for me it was really about talking about it with someone and see their reaction to see you know that I was going through something you know because when you are in a in in a domestic violence situation you're not necessarily knowing that you are you you are so used to the this you know everyday life that it's like normal so when we talking about it and ask question when someone is asking you a question it actually gives you interest of this relationship are you good like what's going on ask questions so the person can talk about it and maybe also see from the reaction that maybe that's something wrong something wrong is going on you know because that's also i think the the the, the little trigger is like it needs a trigger for a person to get out of this situation. Mia, thank you for sharing your story. Like you said, talking is definitely a big step towards getting help. Representative Ichiyama, mm -hmm. what other legal and public policy tools might be explored in the future? Well, we're already preparing for the 2021 legislative session. So uh, we work very closely with the Hawaii Women's Coalition on a package of bills. Uh, some of the ones that have come up consistently in the past are more training for first responders, law enforcement, 
And as we recently expanded the definition of domestic violence, we're definitely taking another look at that. We always want to make sure exactly what Mia just said, that if somebody comes into contact with someone that they think might have experienced domestic violence, we want them to have the tools and the training to respond in a way that's sensitive, appropriate, and helpful. Nancy, I know you're thrilled with this legislation, and I'd like to ask you, in your heart, you've been at this for a long time, what do you see as the solution for domestic violence? Well, um, I wish there were just one thing that I could propose as a solution. Um, it really is going to require a multifaceted investment by all sectors in our community uh, to effectively address domestic violence. I uh, have often thought to myself, this probably won't change in my lifetime, but uh, we're giving it our best and we have to do it together. This is a problem that uh, uh, needs, uh, really requires all of us to recognize, name, uh, invest, identify, and collaborate so that we can have effective and responsive uh, community dialogue and programs uh, that will support people who are experiencing different kinds of abuse. As Mia described, her abuse was isolation and psychological. Sometimes that's hard to see. Um, but one of the things that we did at the beginning of the coronavirus again was to encourage people if they ever had concerns or uh, thought they saw red flags, to reach out to those people and say they're concerned about them. Is there any way they can support them? So everybody has a stake in addressing domestic violence. And it's my greatest hope that we'll all take responsibility for um, meeting the challenge that it is. And I know there is hope and DVAC and all of the measures being taken are a part of the solution. So thank you for all you do. This brings us to the end of our questions. Mahalo to our panelists for participating. Before we wrap up, we'd like to have a quick break to hear from our sponsors. After suffering from abuse for a long time, feeling safe and supported was important to me. I didn't know how to achieve that. I got help from the Domestic Violence Action Center at court. My advocate was with me every step of the way. My kids and I have hope now, and we see the future without fear. There is help, and there is hope, from the Domestic Violence Action Center. If you or someone you know needs help, go to domesticviolenceactioncenter.org and let the hope and healing begin. Anna, thank you again to our four panelists for being a part of our town hall tonight and to our sponsors for your support, the Hawaii Department of Health, the Hawaii Government Employees Association, the Queens Health Systems, and Bronster Fujichaku Robbins. KHON2 will continue these important conversations about domestic violence so that victims have a voice. Tomorrow night, more survivors will share their stories. Six top Hawaii artists will dedicate songs to ending domestic violence, and an auction goes live to support the work by the Domestic Violence Action Center. On behalf of KHON, thank you for watching. Good night.